can start. So it works now. in terms of announcement, uh, there is anything I have to announce? No, I, I mean, uh, you have, uh, uh, if you have a look at the program, uh, you know that uh, this afternoon it's like uh, free, so I encourage you to have a uh, discussion. You can have the discussion wherever you want, in the terrace, in water, in the city, so. But please use it to, to chat with others. And um, then we have uh, the first speaker of this morning, uh, Roberto Mulet, who is going to talk about interacting cells from toy models to the industry. All right. Good morning. Uh, all right. This is my name. I am a physicist. I'm sorry for that. I mean, in the sense that I am a real physicist. Still, half of my life is pure physics, so spin, spin glasses, uh, stuff like that. The other half. It arrived to biology like uh, six or seven years ago. I was a bit bored about physics and about the fact that the Cuban community of physics is small. So I have a few friends working on the industry and they actually in this company, the Center for Molecular Immunology, they produce vaccine for cancer, COVID, a lot of stuff. And they are pretty good and the community is large. And one of the head of the management board of the company is a good friend of mine. He's a physicist from formation. And he asked me to help him to solve a couple of problems. And now I will introduce you to them. And they are not problems from physics. Uh, probably they are not even actually problems from biology. They are problems from the industrial technology. And essentially, he introduced me to this problem. Right? They have this big, big uh, production process. So they do basic research in biochemistry, but also they produce these vaccines. And they had, in practice, the, the, the problem that they have this continued pro, uh, production process of monoclonal antibodies, let's say, and it works perfectly. And sometimes it just fails, and that's it. It just fails, and that's it. No, nobody knows why. They have to start everything again from zero, and that's a good, a big mess. And they didn't understand why. So I said, all right, but we are in Cuba. I mean, the technician got asleep and something changed. The air conditioner didn't work, whatever. But he convinced me that no, that something was uh, intrinsically wrong. And at the same time, they don't have, or they didn't have a conceptual understanding on how to improve the production process, in the sense that there is a lot of experience from their engineers and their technician on what the proper dilution rate of in the fermenters or whatever, but they don't know why. So they, they, they find different outputs using different parameters of the system, and the, and, and the outputs are really different in the sense that they don't always get the same uh, stationary state. So the problem he posed me was something like that. It's very simple. It's this picture. You have a big vessel where you culture cells. The density of cell is X. So you have uh, nutrients given to the cells, but not only nutrients, cells produce, I mean, the proteins that they are interested in, this is SI, I is an index for the, the product they are producing or the nutrients. So the nutrients are putting inside, in, in a continuous mode, the, the vessel with rate D, D, and they are classified by CI, is the concentration, and then with, uh, with the same dilution rate to make it simple, uh, cells and uh, byproducts are extracted uh, with the same rate D. This is not necessarily exactly like this in an industry, but this is a good picture, right? So he explained me the problem. He said, right, this is working, and sometimes it, it gets down, or sometimes changing a bit the parameters, the results are completely different. I don't understand why, so let's try to see. It is important to know that the cells that they use are mammalian cells, so it's a mess. So therefore, I will try to put as less biology as you can. You need to put as less biology as you can because, I mean, it's the mammalian cells, so the, what you know about biochemistry there is much less than what you know about biochemistry or, bio, or biology in bacterial cells, right? So I went to my books, his books, actually, and he asked me this, and all right, this is the way in which you essentially describe this chemostat. just something very easy, so the, the, uh, the rate at which the number of cells uh, increase depends essentially of the growth rate, the death rate, and the dilution rate. This is an equation everybody knows. And this is also an equation for how uh, the concentration of products in the, in the environment change on time. So you have on the right, or on the left, I don't know, depends. 
So you have this, this term that essentially account for how often you introduce nutrients and how often they go out. And this is a term that explains, that gives you how often they are consumed by the cells, right? That's very easy from this point of view. Nothing to discover. Then, all right, who are mu and who are, all right, I can do that. That's physics, that's very easy, that's a, a differential equation. Then he tells me, all right, let's try to understand who is mu. Mu depends on the fluxes inside the cell. And uh, sigma is the death rate, depends on some chemical component, that may depend on some chemical component that are outside in the system. That uh, could be also a situation. But then things become hard because everything is connected. So you have the mu depends on the fluxes inside the cells. That's clear. And uh, sigma, which is the death rate, depends on the concentration of the nutrients. So everything, this is the connection between uh, what is happening. And all right, I say, all right, let's try to see what's happening inside the cell. This is the metabolic network of E. coli. All right, forget it. I cannot do that. I cannot solve both problems at the same time. This is too complicated. I'm a poor physicist. And then what I say is, all right, let's try to simplify stuff. Let's try to understand what the simplest model we can deal with. And then I found this. It's a model that proposed a friend of mine, Alexei Vasquez, and it's probably the simplest model in metabolic network. It's, it's a network in which you consume something, let's say glucose for simplicity. It is transformed in energy and pyruvate. The pyruvate then goes to energy again through respiration cycle or to uh, lactate, all right? And there is one reaction that is uh, bounded, and the idea from, of this paper was essentially that if you bound this reaction that essentially says that you cannot uh, use too many enzymes, you can go to overflow and explain Barbour hypothesis, whatever. That was more or less the idea Alexei had at that time. So I say, all right, let's now try to understand what's happening with this model if we combine with the chemostat, right? That was the first uh, point. And essentially the model you can traduce in this equation, so an equation for the conservation of mass, one equation for the growth rate, and one upper bound for the respiration, right? And the, the intuition was, all right, let's try assume, as usual, that we are in the situation in which cells are trying to optimize or to maximize biomass. You can maximize, maxim, I mean, in a more complex environment, you can max, or more complex cells, you can maximize many other things, but here, essentially, mu is a proxy for E, and that's what you are asking. So in practice, you get to this set of equations. So these are on the top. You have the general equation I wrote in the first slide. On the bottom, the, the same equation, but specify for these. No, I'm sorry. In the top, you have the equation for the density of cells. On the bottom, you have the equation for the nutrients and waste. And then if you put together this, you have to solve. This equation, given that mu depends in this, uh, is represented by the maximization of biomass given by this equation. So, and these are coupled equations because the U, so the how much glucose, for example, you can take will depend not only on the substrates and on the density of cells, so on the, the density of cell X. That's why, because you don't want S to be negative. Right, so you, you, you can guarantee that S will never be negative only if you guarantee that the maximum of urea you can take is bounded in this way. Uh, and this connect equation. So you have these equations here that receive information from the solution of the cell, and the cell that receive information at the same time from, uh, from the density outside in the chemostat. That's more or less the way in which you close this simple uh, equation, right? And in stationary state, that's the picture you get. So you get a picture in which when you move dilution, let's focus on the left uh, figure. When you move dilution, you have one big branch, right? That is what I would say engineer, engineers would like, so to have the, the, the maximum number of cells. But then you can have also a second branch that depends on the uh, death rate connected with the quantity of lactate. And what it may happen, that's why our intuition is that depending on where you start, so the number of cells to, to which you start, or the uh, dilution at which you start, you can get in one branch or in the other branch. More generally, you can have jumps from one branch to the other if you have fluctuation. That was the picture we figured out from the system. On the right-hand side, 
you can imagine, uh, I mean, you find the, the same plot, the same stationary system in which you don't have this contribution of the death rate to the death rate given by the toxics byproduct of the cell, in this case, the lactate. That, let's say, this is the standard picture in which the density of cell increase, but then if the dilution rate is too large, then at some point you are just washing out the chemostat and the dilution of cells goes down. That, that's the standard picture. What we say is that the picture may be more complicated if you assume that there should be some ways that should act as a toxic system, all right? That was the picture you, we, we found, and then at some point you can play with that. Also, and, and here, for example, what happens if you start at a given dilution rate, I mean, it's a fixed number with a few, I mean, with a few cells, and what is happening is that, all right, this is X, that's what is signed there with the arrow, and then you have this uh, production of uh, lactate and glucose. If you start with a different protocol for the dilution rate, you find a different solution, and so on and so forth. This is just a picture of how the dynamics of the system may look like, may look like, all right? And then, of course, Psi, I had to remember you, is this relation between the density of cells uh, and the dilution rates, and essentially defines different transition of the system from overflow to respiration and from competition to no competition. That's very clear, and what is important is that this Psi is, the, uh, is a parameter that you will, we will try to use uh, further because it's the relevant one to characterize the stationary state of the system, right? So then we say, all right, now we have a picture of a toy model that's very beautiful, that explains qualitatively what is happening with the, that, what may be happening with the complexity of this uh, chemostat of you. And let's try now to see whether or not this is, this phenomenology is uh, reproduced in a larger system, all right? Now we did the same work, now we threw away the simple model that we understand, because that's what we can understand. And now we put on the, on the same uh, methodological framework the um, genome scale metabolic network of this mice, rat, I don't know, it's, uh, something like that. And those are now, we move from three reactions to 6,600 reactions, right? And the, uh, the picture is the same. So on, on, on the left, you will resolve the equation for the chemostat. On the right, you will solve the FBA equation for this kind of uh, stoichiometric matrix, right? And the picture, more or less, if you move size similar, so you first have a lot of nutrient because the X is very small. So you are eating everything that you are giving in the media to these uh, cells. So for, for, for the media, we, use, we propose the same media they use in the company. So they have a media, they, they gave us the composition, we put this stuff there, and all these things uh, you can, you start to eat, all right? And varying C, psi, which is equivalent to changing X or changing D, essentially. So what you find is are these kind of transition, and if you look again for the X versus D curve, you find that the phenomenology is maintained. And that's nice, and there is no special fitting parameter, the only thing we are considering is that uh, the death rate depends on the concentration of waste in the system, in this case, acetate and ammonia, and we use number from the literature, essentially. That's, and what we find is essentially that the picture that we had for the toy model is a picture that is uh, acceptable, at least, in the uh, genome scale metabolic network. And that, at that time, we were very happy. Then we started to speak with engineers, all right, now we need to try something, we need to see whether this is true or not. It's, these experiments are very complicated in the sense that these are mammalian cells. So to, to, to see something, you really need to spend a lot of time because the reproduction rate is like uh, 24, uh, 48 hours per day. And so if, as you see, the whole experiment, this is the viable cell density in the system, and the whole experiment took like 90 days. So you can imagine in Cuba, so this is not the production system, so they are doing this in smaller, uh, chemostat, which are, they are not so careful attended as the big one that where they have to use to produce. So therefore, sometimes things uh, go to the hell and they have to start from zero. It took like a year almost to have all this data organized. And all right, let's try to explain the experiment. 
So this girl essentially, so this I didn't do, that was a fantastic student engineer we have. And well, this is time. So they, they put the culture, they decide a, dilution, a given dilution rate, in this case 4.5 per day. I don't know in which scale essentially. But the point is that during some time they, they find what, what, what they call a stationary state, stationary state one. Right at this dilution rate. Then they change the dilution rate, they decrease the dilution rate, and they found a new stationary state. And then they change again, so they continue to decrease the stationary state and found a new dilution rate, increased again, the and now they started to increase again the stationary state. And the point is that they take the same, they, they started to take the same numbers here. So they use 0.4 and 0.4, 0.4, 0.4, and 0.45 and 0.45. And the intuition is that so you want to see and to prove here that you really find at the same values of the parameters different stationary states that the history depends is, is important in the system. And that's what more, more or less at the end what they found. So that the density of variable cells is depend on the history and that you have these two stationary states that more or less uh, are consistent with the picture we, I showed you before. Right? So at that time, we were super happy with the results. Then we did uh, some, I mean, some more studies about um, uh, what now is passion within the engineers about data analysis. And they found that the pathway that are activated are more or less the same pathway we proposed. Yes. Sorry, I don't understand something on this picture. So the idea is that you do an experiment where you shift the, the dilution, dilution and then you move between these yes. two. Okay. Right, that was more or less. At this point, right, our engineers were very happy. And they, all right, now we want to optimize the production process. So to optimize the production process is harder. And the, the intuition is, on some point, either you have to dilute the system, to, to, to optimize the dilution, the, the, the dilution protocol. That's something we're working on. That I'm not going to say anything now, because it's work in progress. And, we are not happy yet with the results. But there is another way in which you can optimize the production process, which is the, to reduce the cost of the nutrients that you're giving to the cell. So the, the intuition is, right, if you give no food to the cell, so if you don't waste money buying to some big company the uh, media to make the cell grow, but still the cell grows and uh, produce the vaccines or the monoclonal antibody that you want, then you're done. Because, all right, it's for cheap, for, for free, you are getting produ uh, you are producing something. But that's, of course, not possible to get. You have to feed the stuff. And the idea is whether you can uh, decrease the cost of the production process. So, uh, yeah, at that point, we say, all right, let's now try to assume that the, the curve we found is reasonable, right? And now you know that there are some costs associated with the production process. In particular, right, this is a fixed cost. This is a cost of, pro of processing the volume of the effluent. And this is the cost actually uh, connected with the nutrients you are providing to the cells. This is the first step. And the, 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 the question is whether we can optimize the first step. So the, the second and the third term, so the third term is the, the fixed cost. So I mean, higher, less uh, drivers, higher, less people cleaning the rooms, higher, less engineers, whatever. This is beta, gamma, vip, gamma is associated with the cost of processing what is coming out, so the volume of the cells. Again, you cannot change this too much. The only thing you can actually work on besides uh, finding people working on the company is to uh, nutrients you're giving to the fermentators, all right? That's what we try. And in this, from this point of view, we, uh, the, the idea is you have the concentration, which is CI, and then you have to optimize uh, how much, oh, I'm sorry, you have the cost of, the, of each uh, nutrient, and you have CI, which is the concentration. The, the, the intuition is that if something is too costly within the, in the media, you have to provide the less concentration of that in the media, but guaranteeing that the cell keeps growing. That's more or less the idea, right? So 
question is, can we fix CI in order to minimize C? So C is the cost, I'm sorry. And the question, the answer is yes. If you look at this, this is a linear optimization problem, right? So in principle, it's very easy. The only thing you need to do is to pose the same problem. You say, all right, if the engineers tell me that I want to have this cell here, I, this, uh, this density of cell, for example, this red point there, by the way, these numbers are compatible with the numbers in the industry. Uh, if, they know, if they tell me this is the x they want to have, and this x was obtained with the given media that they gave me, right? this is the media we're using, let's try to invent a different media that produce the same number of cells. Right? That's, that was the point. And to, and to invent a different media, to, it means to change the concentration of the, of the media, but so minimizing the cost but guaranteeing that the production of cells is the same. That's more or less what's the question. And these are more or less the results. If you look at it, so you will have psi, that as I told you, is the parameter uh, that matters here, is d over x, or x over d. And each panel is a different uh, nutrient. So leucine, proline, cysteine, arginine, as Aspargate, I'm sorry for the names in English. And the red curve, so what is red there, is the media they are using. So it's the concentration that they have in the media. And the green curve are the result of our simulation. That, of course, the, one of the results that, is, that matters here is that, in principle, the amount of media that you have to give to the cell or to the culture depends on the situation of the culture, or, or, and in particular, not only on the situation, on the ratio between D and X. That's one important uh, result. Then if you, leave, if you see the discontinuous line, it is just because it, this is an unstable phase that uh, we described uh, before, that between the high density phase and the low density phase. Right, of course, in most of the, the case, what we, propose, what, what we found is that you should decrease that it is possible, in principle, to decrease the concentration of some uh, nutrients in the media. So you see that in most of the, time, most of the times, the green curve goes below the red curve. So we say, right, you can, you can have a poor media and still guarantee the same X. But of course, now you go to the engineer and you say, all right, we're done. So use a, poor, a poorer media that will cost you less. And they tell me, no, you are crazy. First, because cells do not only use metabolism, so the, the, these uh, products may be there for other things, and they have been, let's say, optimized by some big company somewhere in, in India, I guess, uh, to produce this stuff. Second, because even if you manage to do that, you cannot call the company and say, all right, I need a specific media for myself because it will cost you a lot. You cannot reduce, you cannot say to the company, give me this media just for me. That's something they will not do. So what we say, all right, but now what you can do is to try to uh, keep everything constant and try to introduce more, more uh, nutrients of the, uh, where we propose that there should be more concentration, right? For example, glycine. So if you see glycine here, you see that we propose that you should increase the amount of glycine in the, in the system to get the same mix. And now they are doing experiments on that. So in the next conference, I will explain if we succeed or not to improve the, uh, the production of the production process, all right? But then at that point, I got bored. And that was engineering, and it was the, the problem were technically easy, easy if, if you want. And then I, I, I told you, I am a physicist, so I have a bias on that direction. And then we start to ask, all right, but one of the big assumptions in this problem there was that the chemostat that all the cells in the chemostat were the, were the same. So that was, in fact, kind of mean what we call in physics a mean field approximation, in which what we, what we said, all right, there is not much difference. There is one cell or many cells, all the same. All, all the cells are the same. You can imagine the system like a super cell that is just growing and increasing in density. It makes not too much sense. So the idea is what happens if the system is uh, inhomogeneous. And from this point, and now, Let's try to remind a bit what does it mean in practice. So we have, we already, Marcelo explained and a couple of years ago, a, a few years, a days ago, and somebody gave a tutorial about that, but I will review everything. So 
the way in which we imagine the cell is a way in which what matters is the psychometric matrix. So how metabolites uh, interact to produce other metabolites. And this is easily encode in this equation there. So, so this is the psychometric matrix. This is the velocity of the fluxes. And this is the input and output uh, on the system, all right? And what it tells you is that there is a whole, sp a whole space of solution, of possible solution, because differently from what happened in algebra, uh, in algebra, when you study first years of physics or mathematics or even biology, what, what you find is that you usually find the solution that solves a system of equations. And you are guaranteed to find a solution be you, you, because you have the, no, the same number of equations than variables. Here, you have a problem that is completely different because you have much more variables than equations. In this, in this sense, all these solutions in the gray area are possible solutions of this system there. Right? And the bounds are given because you know the bounds of the, uh, of the reaction. So in principle, a reaction cannot be as fast as the velocity of light. So the reaction has been expanded by biochemical processes. And if you are lucky, biologists, biochemistry tells you which is the bound from experiment or from intuition about which are the reactions that is, uh, are happening there. And in principle, you find this solution. What FBA does, or let's say the, the restrictive version of FBA is to say, all right, this is true, but in principle, to figure out what's the real solution of the cell, what, what cell is happening, you have to assume that cell is doing something, optimizing biomass, reducing the, the amount, uh, minimizing the, the, the glucose, maximizing the yield, maximizing the production of ATP. That's the way in which you tweet the problem to find out one solution. And that's more or less what FBA does. And most of the time, especially when you work in bacteria, but it's not necessary, what you say is, all right, the cells, what it's doing is maximizing biomass, which is more or less, in the first approximation, reasonable. And this is translated in, this, in the fact that together with these restrictions there that defines your problem, you have to maximize some linear function of the parameters. Again, this is not necessarily true. Actually, this is not true in general. It is true only in some, uh, it has been proved to be uh, true in some particular case, but let's stick with that, right? That's what we did in the first part of the talk, to assume that the cells were maximizing biomass, and let's, we assume that this is a general picture, right? You will try to maximize biomass, or maximize something else, or minimize something else, but the idea is, if you say to me that it is not biomass, it is something else, then what is changing is which are the reactions that you put in this part here, right? That's more or less uh, the point. The, 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 the intuition then is how could you assume that the system is not uh, homogeneous in the sense that not all the cells are doing the same. What's the easy or the, the easy way to uh, achieve this tax? Because in, in one case you have all the cells are doing the same. In the other case, you say, all right, every cell is doing whatever she wants, uh, it wants, I think. Uh, and all the possible space of solutions are, are there, and they, I mean, each cell is just a different point in this space. That's more or less the, the intuition. But we, well, I lost. Well, if you realize is that a good way to describe this is to use in this Boltzmann factor, this exponential factor, and then we are going to justify. But the idea is that if you take, instead of assuming that P of B, so the, the space is flat, you will use this beta parameter that may help you to tune the system from all the cells are equivalent to, uh, which is one point, to all the solutions are equivalent. And this, this is the way in which you explode this. So in principle, I mean, if beta is zero, so you don't take care of the exponential. The exponential is not there, so you have only the Dirac delta that is guaranteeing you that you are here inside. I have to control this, all right? If beta is infinite, you, oh, oh wait, wait. This is strange, all right. If beta is really 
you have to be careful. Is beta if is infinite, then you guarantee that the system will get a, a point. One has to be sensible with that. All right, that's more or less the way we take. And then we move, we move on. In principle, it means that if you want to understand the problem, you want to, to understand how this probability, what's the prop, what are the properties of this probability distribution. So beta is just a, pro, a, a proxy to describe the homogeneity or heterogeneity of the culture. That's more or less the solution. Fortunately, it can be used to solve even big problem, a large problem, in the sense that now we have a smart algorithm called expectation propagation that was published in 2013. Now have more than 2,000 sites. Most of them are to archive uh, Wolfram that we were discussing yesterday of the importance of archive. And then there was a rewritten, a rewriting, or actually the discovery of the algorithm by Alfredo Braustein, Ana Paula and Pagnani that uh, they thought it was a new proposal and then they realized that it was already used in the computer science community or in particular to study this kind of problem in the metabolic space. But the idea is that the same way we could do very easily linear programming, we can solve this kind of problem, we can explore this kind of, uh, of space now using this algorithm. It's a bit more, I mean, it's much more complicated than linear programming, but it's also doable. You can find different implementation in Python, I think in Julia for sure, in C, in GitHub. Jose has one of them. That's the picture. So what we are doing now is, now we are, to the problem we had at the beginning, now we are introducing this idea of the heterogeneity, right? And this is the result, I'm not going to go to the detail, but in principle what you find is that this is the toy model, this is the uh, 6,000 uh, 6, reaction model, right? And what you find is that heterogeneity, of course, will change to the, the kind of results, in particular, if there is no optimization, you will lose the uh, two branch uh, structure. More important, if you go to the complex system, so to the system with 6,000 reactions, what you find is that in certain case, so you will find that here, they, you will find here that it goes above the red curve although it's less uh, heterogeneous, it's more heterogeneous. So you will find this kind of trade-off in which heterogeneity may help you to increase the uh, density of, uh, of cells, all right? But then there are... Uh, sorry, oh. Roberto. Just, yes. uh, so in the previous plot, the fact that uh, the scale of this uh, lambda m uh, is very different uh, is because you have a prefactor which depends on the size of the network? Uh, yes, and the, and the, uh, and the, and the value of the fluxes, and the value of the fluxes, because here you have a ton model in which the fluxes goes from zero to one, and here you have the fluxes that are bounded by pure biological numbers, let's say, so the numbers are completely different. But yes, this is a good question, a technical question. All right, then, all right, I get bored again, because I say, right, this is a very trivial way to introduce heterogeneity, and I know that there is much, there should be much more than that, or I had the intuition at the time, and, then we move to the second question. And I want to remind you this plot that was presented by Andrea De Martino. He essentially showed these uh, cells moving around a, a film, and he showed that some of the cells were producing acetate, and changing the pH of the system, and some other cells were just consuming the acetate, I think, was the, the, the system. And so you have the colors of the, on the top you have different pictures uh, with colors saying which is consuming or which is producing something. And then you have this beautiful curve, this beautiful panel you find in the paper that I'm not going to describe. It's not my, my work. And then, of course, it's not the only case. Then I found a different example. So this is a culture in which they have yeast. In principle, it's an isogenic culture. This is the colony start to, increase, to, to grow. And what they found is that cells in the border of the culture are eating something, like are eating sugar in particular, and cells that are inside the culture are essentially eating the byproducts produced by the cells in the, in the border, all right? And then, of course, there is a lot of 
literature about the, this heterogeneity even in uh, simple culture, and here we have discussed a bit about that, although in a more general context. Uh, therefore, all right, I say, all right, now this is the picture I had for these cells that were there. They were not interacting. The only thing I said was they were just using different metabolic state. Now they are interacting. If you see this and you are a physicist, there is a trivial way to assume that cells are interacting, right? And then it's to assume that this age is not anymore what you have here, but now that you have this kind of interaction between cells. This is the three, I mean, it just come to, my, to your mind in two seconds. And that's the way in which you will assume that cells are interacting. Then we can discuss what's the meaning in this context. But the idea is that you have a first term in which cells are maximizing biomass. This is tuned by beta, that is multiplying everything. And then now you have a second term in which cells are not only optimizing biomass, but depending on the value of J, they are exchanging uh, given fluxes or they are competing for a given nutrient, trying to both maximize the same, uh, yes? So I'm now, I'm confused at what All right, I will be. All right, there are two indices. I is an index for the cell. Now you have many cells in your system, which is this I, and I and J. So cells I interact with cells J, right? And R is an index for the reaction. So in a reaction for the cells I, so, no, never mind. See how the people did? All right, in, in cell I here, you will have, you will try to optimize, for each cell I, for each element of the sum, you will try to optimize some uh, combination of the reaction. This is what happened before, this is FBA if you want, right? And then you have cell I interact with cell J through some flux G R I J. So R says, which is the, the flux, so the cell flux that cells I is, uh, with which cells I is interacting with cell J. That's more or less the, the I don't know if it's clear, right? Then, of course, once you're there, uh, now, I mean, the physicists come out, statistical physics come out. What do you mean, diagonal? So, yes, flux, flux three interacts with flux three. And never with any other flux. In, I mean, only through the stoichiometric matrix of, of directly, no. But in directly, yes, because then you have the stoichiometric matrix, right? That if you are introducing something, everything should maybe should conserve it be there. So, this delta, the Dirac delta should be valid. And also because you are trying to optimize stuff yourself independently. So it interacts indirectly, right? If you consume something, still everything within the cell should be conserved. That's the way. So the idea of, of interacting flux three with flux three is that I produce lactate and you consume lactate. This is flux three. Flux three may be bidirectional in this case. So I produce lactate and you consume lactate. That's the intuition more or less. So, that's something that we have seen here around in the community, but that's, let's say, the easy way in which physicists can put this in a Hamiltonian form. If you, you, you can also imagine a lot cover terrex scenario in which this is valid if you have symmetric interaction. So you can imagine that you can write down dynamical equation that have a minimum in this kind of Lagrange function, but that's, let's say, for real physicists, uh, whatever. So this is the point, and then what we need to say, all right, now let's try to assume the J is a, is a random number that comes from a Gaussian distribution. And this is, uh, and then we say, all right, again, we start with the simplest possible model. This is the, that this arrow there is coming in. So it's, uh, the, the upper arrows should be coming in, and this is uh, glucose. And this is the simplest model you put it there. And then you take, I mean, you go to Paris' course, take all the machinery of the replica symmetry stuff, and this is the picture you get, right? If there is no interaction, so this delta there is the randomness in the interaction, this, this is what you get. So this is for J equals zero, so there is no special trace. Then you have an uniform distribution at beta infinite, then you have that things start to happen and move to the right, and then you get the usual solution of FBA, right? This is the picture that came out from physics for this simple model, of course. That, that's what you can do analytically if you want. And then if there is, a randomness, some cells that eat something that produce for others. 
the picture change, and this is really beautiful, because when you take its first and uniform distribution, which is trivial, so if beta is infinite, well, what is happening is that all the cells are doing whatever they want, so they don't care about their, their neighbor, I'm sorry. Um, then when beta start to increase, so the interactions start to be relevant, so you start to find different minima. And of course, at beta zero, instead of having just one minima in the, in the border of the polytope, what you find is that you have different minima. And the, the, the different minima indicates you, so the, the intuition is that they indicate you the possible state in which the culture can be. So you will find cells with different, and that's what in physics we call spin grass state. So the, you will have a lot of minima, and depending on the initial condition or fluctuation, or whatever, you can figure it out different uh, minima solution. That's the intuitive picture you find from this simple model. Then you can go further and again, using expectation propagation, trying to solve the si a similar problem, the same problem, but not for the toy model, but you can go to the network of E. coli. And then you can ask yourself what would be the distribution of the fluxes in a culture made by E. coli, in which E. coli because it's a corner was very easy to, to use. And you may assume that some E. coli cells are producing lactate and some other are, uh, introducing lactate, are consuming lactate, the byproduct. And what you find is that, indeed, the uh, way distrib the, the distribution of the fluxes is different. So you find in each line. Yes, I will. So in the x axis, you have flux. In the y axis, you have the probability of having this flux. So you can ask, what's the probability of, in this system, that if I take a cell at random, the, she will ha it will have a, a given flux. And then you take many cells and you make the probability. But here, this is analyti analytical computation. Modulo, you are using max n to make the computation, all right? So what you find is that the picture changes enormously if you move from one uh, system to the other, right? From one situation in which you have different uh, noise terms and interaction terms <coughs> Uh, from the other, and there you have the flux of consumer of glucose, production of acetate, citrate, lactate, biomass, whatever, and you see that the, that the, the situation is uh, completely different. And what I think is that this is a message to uh, you, if you want to experimentalize experiment that one should be care, very careful to understand what is measuring, right? Because in the, the dependently, in, in principle, it depends a lot if you want to understand what is happening inside the cell or with the fluxes inside the cell, whether you are in a situation in which cells are interacting or are not interacting. That's what I think is the message, the main message we send there. And then, all right, now I am almost finishing. I have one minute, two minutes, how? Five minutes? Yeah, you're very relaxed. You're not like the bastard that was yesterday here organizing this stuff. And all right, now I will, I will do the problem the, the other way around. Uh, because, of, of, of course, as, as soon as I move a lot from, you know, um, to physics, so people from the, my friend from the industry tell me, all right, but try to go back and, and, and close again, and, and close against uh, the gap between us. And all right, the problem was, all right, now they have this chemostat and they would like to understand what is happening inside the system with the minimum of, of information. So we're in Cuba, we cannot measure many things. Actually, we can measure only a few things, cos and os. And therefore, they say, right, don't give, don't ask, I mean, don't tell me that you will need the, all the proteomics of the system, whatever, because you just don't. So it's no way that uh, I will give you that to, to understand what is happening inside. Right? I say, all right, I will do my best. Uh, it's not easy. And then we say, all right, let's try to now imagine that we have a culture in the chemostat. And, all right, I, I just, uh, all right, I for, we'll forget about it. I will go, uh, we have a few time. And uh, we use something similar to what Marcelo explained the other day, which is uh, maximum entropy. So there are many standard approaches in the literature. One of the, I mean, the one we are going to, comp to compare is essentially FBA that, uh, given the data, maximize some linear function, essentially, and try to figure out what is, uh, what is inside the, the system. So the point is, you have some experimental data, which is this VI average exp, this is experimental data. You know that if you are inside the polytope, it should fulfill this uh, equation there, which is the constraint, that's a typical inference problem. And the, the point is, all right, which is the P of V, 
that guarantee that you maximize the entropy of the system. Right? That's a typical inference uh, problem. For, I mean, for those of you that still remind the talk of Marcelo, the, the, the difference here is that while Marcelo made an answer about the property of the P of B, here the P of B are calculated exactly. The, pay, the, the price you pay is that the computation is much more hard that you need to go to, max, uh, to expectation propagation to solve it. So you cannot do it, uh, I mean, fast in a computer. It's uh, kind of painful, but you can do it for certain cells. And then we get, went back and let's say, remember our toy model of the chemostat? This is a, the toy model, oh, no, sorry. This is the toy model of the chemostat. And then we'll say, all right, now let's try to design a toy model in which you have heterogeneity, it's like in which you have fluctuation and cells are not only, I mean, you, you, cells may move from one metabolic state to the other. This is the standard way to do it. So if you look carefully, you will have the same term. Now forget about the epsilon. This is mu x. This is minus dx. And, and then the epsilon is and you're telling you that if you are in one state, you can move back from this state or you can go into this state. That's what this epsilon is giving you. If epsilon is zero, again, you recover the toy model. If epsilon is different from zero, you get lost from the toy model. And then we started with that. But then my super student realized that this is too simple. If you, if you take a model with just two reactions, then uh, it's not too different what max n can show you with respect to uh, the approaches used by FBA. Because essentially, since you have just two reactions, one of them is already fixed by the constraint of the problem of the fact that you are in a, in a chemostat. So that's not what interesting. Are the Sorry? What are the states? No, the, the states are continuous and are, the, you know, the growth rate and, for example, the consumption of glucose. Well, the, 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 now the states are defined by the metabolic state. So what's the value of the flux on a given reaction? Right? Then we move back. We move again. We'll say, all right, try me something simple. And he told me, no, no it's easy. Take the one we use in the, picture, in the, in the paper. And I say, all right, I cannot try to explain this kind of reaction. Please make me a draw of the system. And then my uh, biochemical student said, all right, this is the draw. This is simple. I say, no, please, because I know we didn't solve this problem. So we solved something much more easier. And he now again yesterday finally sent me something like that. So it's the same problem we had before, just with one more reaction, essentially. That's more or less the way uh, we, did, we, we did with the problem. And therefore, the questions move to this, in which you just introduce one more reaction. Right? This is the, the, the dynamics of the chemostat, in which you can imagine that cells are not always in the same uh, status. All right, and more or less this is the picture increasing epsilon, so increasing the disorder. You find a system that moves from this kind of curve there, in which they are stationary state, to this one here, which is visible. If the cells is not maximizing biomass, which is what we were assuming, and there is a lot of noise in the system, so of, of course the growth rate cannot be so large, so X will not be so large, and there is this change in X, and of course, this change in the consumption of glucose. From the simulation, are they going to extinction or that they're stabilizing? They may go to extinction at some point. I'm not sure. But they'll say eventually they will extinct. No, it is, uh, no, they will not so extinct. The problem is that, of course, the density will be so low that, in principle, if it were not but a continuous. If you, yeah, if you look at log x, is, uh, is it that exponential? So if you look at the log no, x. But there will be like always cells that are almost, ah, okay. uh, you know, I mean, consuming very few of uh, glucose, uh, they will be moving around the whole polytope. There will be, uh, uh, if epsilon is too, la uh, too, small, too large, they will essentially be moving around the polytope all the time. So some cells will be alive all the time. But the density will be slow, because essentially only a few of them, only a small fraction, will be consuming a lot of glucose and producing a lot of biomass. But that realized here is that perhaps there is a phase transition, but I didn't. We didn't check. All right. And now, all right, let's pose the problem with this toy model. Now you have put in, in concrete terms what we had before about how uh, maximum entropy works. So you have the, the growth rate that is equivalent in this experiment to the dilution rate. So this is fixed. This is something the experimentalists will tell you. You have this constraint. Then you have a second constraint that is given by the concentration of the nutrient limitant. In this case, it's very easy because it's uh, glucose. And then you know if you uh, find out the maximum entropy principle that you have this exponential form for this uh, stuff. And this is the plot. 
right, now what we did, we took the, dynamic, the dynamics of this system in which you have this heterogeneity. We assume that this is an experiment. Somebody gave us the result of the experiment, right? The, the density of cells and the, uh, and the concentration of glucose at the beginning. And now we try, these are different panels in which we try different optimization uh, techniques, right? And you see is that every technique in which they try to maximize one a, a, a given flux, so biomass, consumption of oxygen, uh, consumption of, oxy of glucose or whatever, they all differ. At some point, one of the flux is lost. So you see all the curve on the top, right? Some, some, sometimes they get lost. So in principle, you have in the x-axis, you have the prediction or the experimental value, the one that the simulation gave you. And the, on the y-axis, you have the uh, prediction, right? And you would like this to be a straight line. And what you find is that it is only a straight line in the max entropy case, so in the case we try. So otherwise, you lose always something. And just to finish, we did the same for genome scale metabolic network. So you take the same, so say similar data from a colleague experiment in chemostat. If somebody knows there, somebody else that has more data, even in more complex network, it will be very welcome, but it's hard to find this. And again, you will find different columns are different FBA uh, inference problem. The last one is maximum entropy, and different lines at different dilution rates, right? To see the difference, it's better to plot, this, plot it here. So you will find different symbols are different uh, FBA approaches. And in blue, which is, I think is the only one that's clear, is our approach. You see that the data is poor, so you cannot decree, I mean, improve too much over standard FBA. But if you notice, the most, let's say, stable one that is more or less always working is maximum entropy, right? Otherwise, the, the others, uh, they may take one of the few better than maximum entropy, but then you take more. And now it's done. So I would like to finish saying which are some of my old problems, the problem I had that uh, were interesting to me before I arrived here. Now I have to reach out for everything after the conference. But one big problem for me is who's beta. So what's the physical or biological way in which you interpret beta? Because for us, beta can be interpreted very mathematically as a Lagrange multiplier to fix stuff if you are doing an inverse problem. But clearly, it is very intuitively or a very easy trick to be used when you try to you know, move from the FBA solution to the full space solution. But it's not clear from the biological point of view what is the actual meaning. People have been trying. But I think that nobody, no, our friends have tried to interpret beta, are very happy uh, with the uh, answers we have about what's the interpretation, the proper interpretation, if there is a proper interpretation about it. And then an important thing that I think that I should like, I would like to answer is how can you differentiate between different heterogeneities? Because it is clear, I mean, that is, there is an heterogeneity that is given by the fact that the cells are not the same. So uh, let's say, but the cells are, let's say, prone to suffer from a lot of internal fluctuation. So regulation effects, uh, number of proteins uh, produced by in, inside the cell at, the, at each moment. Uh, and there is, so even if the cells are uh, isogenic, there is a lot in, of internal fluctuation. But then there is a different heterogeneity in which cells interact. So even if we are the same, for some reason, I produce lactate and you consume, and you start to consume lactate. That is something we have seen here uh, a lot of time. And the idea is whether can I, f whether or not I can differentiate from outside, just making microscopic measurement, what, why are these uh, heterogeneity arising? Right, that's the second. Uh, then we have another problem, which is the, what's the best, which is again close to the industry. What is the best strategy to functionalize the psychometric matrices? So the point is that when you find a psychometric matrix in the, in, the, in, the, in the web, this is a super psychometric matrix. This is the super E. coli, the super human network, the super, the, the super GIS network, in the sense that this is the network that in principle does everything. So if you go to the human, you have a network 
that is the same network for the brain, for the neurons, and for the liver, and for the kidney. And it's clear that our cells in the, in the well, for most of the people, the cells in the brain are different from the cells of the kidney. Then we find that it's not absolutely true, but in principle it is. And then you would like to understand how to functionalize this network using, again, the less amount of information. All right. Another thing that we would like is to introduce a regulation in this kind of model, even in the toy models. It's not easy to put together metabolism and regulation. Try to design a simple model that is solvable, that is comprehensible, and where you can control both processes is hard to uh, define. And then, of course, can we find or define a, metabolic, a minimum metabolic core? Well, that's it. And these are my collaboration on the left hand side. You have uh, half of the people are my PhD students, the other half have super engineers from the Center of Molecular Immunology that brought me to this problem. And on the right hand side, you see my collaborations here in Europe on this subject. And that, with that, I'm late, I'm sorry. I will be more gentle tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, I suggest uh, to, uh, that we have time for a question, and uh, while the question is asked, uh, we can sort of transition to the next speaker. So, yeah, the next speaker is checking devices. So, any question? So it looks very interesting to introduce this heterogeneity in the in the models. Um, but a big problem with FBA is, of course, that if you make it somewhat more complicated, you can't do it for big models anymore. So do you have an estimate of of how large the models can be that you can still solve them in this way? Well, let's say for FBA, in the sense of maximizing a growth rate or whatever, infinite. So this is in a program, this is infinite. If you want to understand how to, sorry. if you want to compute the space of solution, I think now it's feasible all two thousand of reactions. So we are close to really big uh, stuff. There, what is hard is that there may be many details that are not compatible with the uh, solution. You may be losing a lot of stuff because of wrong annotation in the system. But in principle. It is painful. It's not like linear programming that you just work with 10,000 equations, 100,000, and that's, that's it. But I think that up to a few thousands, uh, you can play with that. So it's already, so expectation propagation almost get to uh, genome scale metabolic network. Of course, if you want to do something in which you have to explore a large range of parameters or conditions, that's more complicated because it may take a much more time, but for a few stuff, you can do it easily in your laptop even, so it's not that you need something else. Right? Ah. Um, yeah, J uh, just a comment to the beta. I imagine that as a Lagrange multiplier, it's related to the temperature in physical systems. Yes. And okay. so my, my idea was that one interesting thing about the temperature is that it tells you whether two, if you take two systems, whether they can coexist in that state or not. So I was wondering if also in this case, if you maybe have two I populations, it tells you something about the relation between, uh, no? I don't know. Okay. Uh, as mm -hmm. I told you, let's say these beta have been around in the community uh, already for a while, at least five or six years. We always give a general, ex very general explanation, uh, but we don't have really a derivation. So my, my intuition, if you want to go back to physics, is that the same way the temperature in physics you can, I mean, at least in statistical physics, like the degrees of freedom you are not controlling, you are not interested in, like phonons, for example, if you are looking for a spin, for a spin system. So the temperature is a measure of how these photon, phonons are acting. Here I would like to have a similar picture in which instead of having, you know, the metabolism, so the, the fluxes, I will, know, I will have the noise that is somehow tuning this uh, stuff. But we don't have a model, you know, we need Pyrels to really explain this stuff. I, we haven't done that. Um, I have a question here yes. about uh, the um, replica machinery you are employing. Because mm -hmm. when you say, okay, I set myself into the replica symmetric phase of the theory, whatever, and then, but you have order parameters. Do you have any comments about uh, 
the equations for the order parameters and their interpretation? Let's say, or? It's the sun, let's say the problem is simple. You can solve everything, say, for the order parameters, and you, and you find different phases as in the replica machinery, mm -hmm. depending on the value of j and delta. If you realize it's not a complex problem in the sense that it's like a P spin in which the spins, are, let's say, oh, I'm sorry for the biology, but it's like a P spin in which you take all the fluxes, but instead of having the sum of all the fluxes equal to one or one over a or, or, or n, here the sum may have some minus because it's defined by the uh, stoichiometric matrix. So some fluxes are coming out or in. That's first. Second, uh, you don't have three spin multiplying, so you, you have a kind of two spin interaction with continuous variables, and then you have a sternal field that is given by the, by the growth rate of the cell. So from this point of view, it's quite easy. The problem is that what we did that it was not easy at all was to how you solve this when you don't have three fluxes, but when you have many, like in E. coli. And once you have many, so all the machinery must go within the expectation propagation that is the one that allows you to explore the configuration space, which is equivalent to, to it's a fast way if you want also to compute the partition function, okay. the replicated partition function. But that's, you know, that's technical details. Okay, that's, thank uh, you. Sorry. Okay, so I suggest to thank uh, Roberto again. <laughs> and, uh,